Welcome to the second Q&A high school special. I'm Tony Jones. Tonight, our panel is facing questions from an audience of high school students. And here to answer their questions, a panel of both students and politicians. Young Conservative Lauren McGrath Wild from Presbyterian Ladies College, Deputy Opposition Leader and Shadow Education Minister Tanya Plibersek, Indonesian-born Arthur Lim of Moorbank High, the outgoing captain of Burwood Girls High, Nadia Homan, and Education Minister Simon Birmingham and aspiring politician Geordie Brown from Oxley High School in the country music capital of Tamworth. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> so Q&A is live across Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Daylight Saving Time and you can stream us around the world on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. We'll go straight to our first question. It's from Rene Carmus. With close to 50% of Australians being born overseas or having at least one parent born overseas, Section 44 of the Constitution does not reflect modern day Australia. Why is it still in place? Nadia, I saw you nodding, so I'll go straight to you. I absolutely 110% agree. We're moving into an increasingly globalised, multicultural Australia. Why does Section 44 still exist? It's in no way a reflection of 21st century, 2017, almost 2018 Australia. I think it's time that it be uh, looked at, amended, um, to more accurately reflect our values and an increasingly multicultural Australia. So, briefly, time for a referendum to change the Constitution in your view? Uh, yes. Arthur? I think that Sections 44 exists to ensure that all politicians of all sides are allegiant to Australia and Australia only, that they don't have any foreign powers exerting their influence over them. So I think Section 44 needs to stay in place to ensure that Australian politicians have Australian interests at heart. Tony Plibersek. Well, I think if you were drafting the Constitution today, you probably wouldn't put this provision in because one of the great strengths of Australia is our multicultural community. The trouble is to change the Constitution, you need to have a referendum. And I, I also think it's a big ask to expect the Australian people to put up with the expense and the, the trouble of a, a referendum on this element of the Constitution. If we can't get a referendum right to acknowledge that Indigenous Australians have a special place in Australia. If we can't actually get that done, I don't think people are going to forgive politicians for holding a referendum just to make our own lives a bit easier. Maybe you could do them both together to save money. Well, I, I think, uh, actually, the more important one is obviously the recognition of, for Indigenous Australians and uh, something that... I mean, the easiest way for us not to fall foul of Section 44 of the Constitution is actually just to check that we're not citizens of any other country. So, Tanya, uh, just briefly on this, um, Labor's plan was for universal disclosure, so all MPs were going to have to do that. That sounds pretty much like what the Prime Minister is now promising to do. Are you going to go along with that? Well, we'd very much like to help the government sort this out because I think most Australians are actually sick of the soap opera. Um, we're not really sure what the Prime Minister's proposal uh, is in detail. We're, we've We'll sit down with the government, I think, on Wednesday and talk through the proposal, but we're not sure at this stage whether what the Prime Minister's proposing would actually have dealt with uh, Barnaby Joyce's situation or any of the others who've been disqualified. We, we just simply don't know the answer. Well, let's hear from the government. Simon Birmingham. Well, the proposal is, uh, is pretty simple, which is that every Member of Parliament, House of Reps, Senator, would have to put on the record their citizenship status, um, both at the time of the last election and now, their understanding of that, where they were born, where their parents were born, if they indeed held other citizenship previously in their lives, what steps they took and when they took them uh, to renounce that citizenship uh, or to see it taken away from them by changes of laws in other countries. So we really are putting out a full disclosure package in that sense for every MP and Senator to act upon. We hope that the Labor Party will be True to the word they've said about wanting to see disclosure and back us in doing so, and that ultimately we can really put this behind us. But I think to Renee's question as well, it is important that we then make sure that in terms of the advice that's available and information that's available to Australians who want to run for parliament, that it's really clear to them in the future as to how they make sure they're eligible, because it is critical that in a country like Australia we don't disenfranchise large parts of the population. What about to Nadia's point that, that inevitably that's what's going to happen? 
that uh, people who want dual citizenship can't run for parliament. Well, Tony, I hope that's... It's an awful not, lot of people. I, I hope, Tony, that's not the case, uh, that individuals can find smooth and easy, easy pathways to deal with this with countries with whom they may have citizenship entitlements. But this is one of the reasons why, after the High Court handed down its statement, that the Prime Minister said, we do want to get a parliamentary committee to look at the implications of it. It may be that you can manage this sensibly through the Electoral Commission, through good, clear advice to individuals. It may be that actually there is a part of the population who could be disenfranchised, which would lead to a situation where we ought to think about changing the constitution. But let's, so get, what, let's deal with the current you personally, problem. You personally open to a referendum? I'd rather we didn't have to go down that path, because I think people do expect that members of the Australian Parliament making foreign policy and defence decisions on behalf of Australians ought to have Australia's interests only at heart, and that that's the approach that people would expect. But if we seriously have a problem that could disenfranchise <laughs> okay. people, then we must deal with it. All right, now do you want to jump back in, and you can. Yeah, just in reference to what Simon just said about having solely Australia's interests at heart, which was also the crux of um, Arthur's argument, I don't think, as a dual citizen myself, if I were to run for public office one day, that my interests would lie with Portugal. Um, if I were to run for public office, my predominant, my main focus would be Australia and serving the country and, and representing a f pro pro myself appropriately and my electorate appropriately in public office. And I don't think that having a dual citizenship can significantly... But would you give away a political ambition if you knew you had to give up your dual citizenship? My dual citizenship allows me to pack up, live and work overseas. So it's something that I would have to seriously consider if politics was a route that I wanted to pursue, which at this point it is not. Um, but to, to renounce a dual citizenship is would be, for me personally, something significant. Geordie, what do you think? Well, just to go back to the question, I'm not necessarily sure that it's a, a referendum that we need. I think we just need responsible politicians who have the care to actually check if they are dual citizens and not to show um, what I would perceive as a level of disrespect to not go through all of the protocols um, before actually applying to be a politician. So, for example, in my electorate, Barnaby Joyce was, was, a, was a member for Parliament for 12 years. And over that 12 years, he was paid $2.8 million. And, and for me, that is just unacceptable. For me, that um, shows a level of disrespect to the office that he represents. Lauren, what do you think about that? I think it is so important to preserve Section 44 of the Constitution. And despite the fact that a lot of the politicians that have been embroiled in this saga um, weren't aware that they were dual citizens and did have Australian interests at heart, we don't know what the future looks like. And we also don't know who future politicians might be. Now, if we just look at this really logically, if we have a politician who is a dual citizen of Australia and country B, and Australia and country B go to war, Australians need to know that that politician has their interests at heart, that they are making decisions that benefit Australians. Even something simple, we've got that dual citizen negotiating trade and economic agreements with another country. We need to know that our politicians are making the right decisions and that they are doing it with only Australian interests at heart. So I think it is so important to preserve it and I don't think a referendum is the way forward. OK, a good range of opinions on that issue. Let's see what other issues bring. The next question is from Tahere Wijitalaka. Considering the country's debt, the increasingly ageing population and other pressures on our budget, it's likely that our generation will bear an increasingly high tax burden while receiving a poorer and fewer government services. So in light of this context, my question to the panel is, what should the government do now to, um, to manage the explosive findings of these Paradise Papers? And how is it fair that the wealthy avoid paying their share of tax, even though they're more able to bear the burden? Geordie, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks for that great question. It is absolutely unacceptable to see this sort of behaviour. I know that in, in a lot of cases that it is legal, um, but for me, from an ethical standpoint, it is absolutely unacceptable. Because if you look at some of the Australian companies, such as the mining companies who are in our country, who are avoiding paying tax um, through hedging their bets with other international currencies, um, what we're missing out on from, as Australia, as a nation, really is um, the biggest issue for me. We, all that, the tax that we could be accumulating 
could be coming um, into health and education and defence and other areas like that which really should be a higher priority. And I think that the government needs to intervene and, and to include some sort of legislation to make it harder to achieve. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, the Labor leader in Britain today, said um, the Paradise Papers leaks show there's one rule uh, for the super rich and another one for the rest of us. I, that sort of sounds like what you're saying, Jeremy. Mm, absolutely. And, and that's exactly what I'm saying. And I think at the end of the day, we all have to accept that we're all human and we all um, should be given the same chance as each other. And it's not acceptable to have some people who abide by one rule and others who don't. Lauren, what do you think about this? It's not illegal. Um, it may not be illegal. It's on the sort mm. of dark side of legality. Um, mm. But it, a lot of rich people have mm. buried their money in these tax havens. What do you think? I think it's absolutely wrong. And I think when we have a look at actually one of the examples that was brought out today, uh, one of them was Glencore. And they are a mining company that mine in Australia, that take Australian resources, that are making their money out of Australia, and then they have subsidiaries in, in countries like the Cayman Islands and Bermuda. They, men, they then make an intracorporate transfer there and they avoid all the tax in Australia. To, they push the money to countries where there happens to be little to no tax, and this is completely wrong. Companies need to pay their fair share of tax. It's only right. They're making their money in Australia and of course, because of that, they should be paying their taxes to Australia. Arthur, what do you think? I think Lauren's got a good point there, but the issue is that it's such a fine line between tax avoidance and tax evasion. So I think what needs to happen is there needs to be a greater um, regulatory clarification as to what constitutes tax avoidance, which is illegal, and, w sorry, tax avoidance, which is unethical but not illegal, and tax evasion, which is illegal. So I think if, if, we can, if we can decide what forms of tax minimisation strategies are illegal or unethical, if we make the distinction a lot clearer, I think everyone will feel, everyone will feel that, they, that the big companies are paying their fair share of tax. If, if governments can say what you're doing here is not right, it's beyond unethical, it's illegal. So, Arthur, I'm going to ask you this. I, I know that you, you could end up in the audit or finance world, um, yes. judging by your ambitions and where you're headed. What if some rich client came to you one day and said, I'd like to put my money somewhere where I pay no tax or very little tax at all? It's probably legal, but it's on the dark side. What would you say to them? Well, I don't plan on working in the tax world. I think I'm more... Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm more into the... You sound um, like you're more in the political world. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd like to enter a field where I am confident that the work that I do is, is transparent, it's ethical, and I'm not doing it to the detriment of other people. I think, I think the, the tax minimisation strategies used by businesses, I think it falls almost on the dark side. The issue is, yes, it's legal, but there is so much negative publicity around it that I feel it's not worth my time being there. Tanya Plibersuk. I'm just so reassured to, to hear from the three um, who've spoken already that the vast majority of people and companies pay their fair share of tax. And um, the, the highlighting in these, the Panama Papers and the Par Paradise Papers now, um, show the unethical behaviour of the super rich and some companies that uh, is to the detriment of all of us. So we need to take a systemic approach that, first of all, reinforces that most people do the right thing because people, if they think the tax system's broken, then they don't want to pay their share either. So you have to reinforce that most people do the right thing. And then you have to close every loophole. And that's what we tried to do when we took over the chair of the G20, um, move internationally on the base erosion and profit shifting agenda so that Australia worked in concert with other countries to prevent big companies gaming the system. And we also need to amend our domestic laws to make sure that we have tax transparency for private and public companies showing what they pay, showing which countries they're domiciled in for taxation purposes. We need to resource the Australian Tax Office. I think it was very short-sighted of the government to cut resources from the Tax Office because if you're going to catch the cheats, you have to have the resources to do it. Um, so uh, how we collect 
tax is every bit as important as how we spend it, doing it in the fairest possible way and spending it in the right way. Uh, Simon, Birmingham, were you shocked uh, by the revelations on Four Corners and in other sectors of the media? The Queen's involved in this. Um, a large section of, of Donald Trump's cabinet are involved in these kind of offshore arrangements. Hillary Clinton, um, in, in terms of uh, her biggest fundraiser, also involved indirectly. I mean, it's, it's endemic. Tony, it's, Among the it's, super rich. And, and Tony, it's probably sad to say, no, not necessarily shocked, uh, because we've seen these types of revelations before. Uh, now, the principle we heard from Lauren at the outset, that money that's earned in Australia ought to be taxed in Australia, that where people are making income out of our country in terms of goods and services that they provide here, then we should expect that tax is reasonably paid here. And that's really been the driving principle behind a number of the reforms that we've implemented as a government. Some of them have uh, followed on from some of the multilateral arrangements that previous governments have worked on as well, putting in place things like uh, the multinational anti-avoidance law and the diverted profits tax, which is going to capture and ensure that an estimated $7 billion worth of spending in Australia that previously hadn't been subject to Australian tax will now be subject to Australian taxes. Uh, we've seen major global companies, companies like Facebook and Google, restructure their business operations in Australia so that they will be compliant with these new laws, which will result in them paying more tax in Australia rather than previous arrangements. Now, uh, to the points that I think Arthur was wisely making, people will always seek to try to minimise the tax that they pay. And the challenge for governments will always be to make sure that people, particularly those of greater means, are paying their fair share. Uh, and that is something that we need to be ever vigilant about and we've really made the changes to the laws to make sure that's the case. Nadia, what do you think? Are I you th satisfied with what the government's doing? Um, I think everything that's, that needed to be said about this, I most pretty much wholeheartedly agree with. Um, it's absolutely unjust, it's unethical, it's absolutely unacceptable, the fact that the rich are living by one rule and the, um, everybody else is living by another. The average taxpayer is ultimately going to have to end up compensating for this loss in tax, and that is, in and of itself, absolutely unacceptable. Um, that money could be going to fund hospitals, it could be going to fund education programs, it could be going to fund mental health programs for youth and disadvantaged young people across the country. But instead, it's being lodged into offshore accounts in tax havens where the rich get to live by different rules. It is unacceptable and I think the government needs to be enforcing stricter penalties about this. And as Arthur said, um, in, uh, implementing greater processes to ensure that we can differentiate between evasion and we can differ and, and um, avoidance. 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 Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. That's okay. That's You're watching the uh, Q&A High School special. Our next question comes from Libby Ebsworth. I proudly attend a world-class public high school on the south coast of New South Wales. The school offers me a wide variety of curricular and extracurricular activities. Why would anyone pay approximately $30,000 per year to attend a private school? And what would the schools do to justify that fee? Simon. Well, there are a range of reasons as to why people choose to pay in terms of the values they might seek, faith-based education, other purposes. Look, Libby, uh, I'm a product of the public school system myself uh, and of course it achieves wonderful, wonderful outcomes and it's essential to make sure that every Australian, whatever their background, has an access to high quality education uh, and that is something that I know is a passionate view that Tanya holds, that I think every member of the Australian Parliament holds. And we believe that parents and families equally deserve a right to choose if they choose to pursue a non-government education for whatever reasons those families may individually have, well, that's their choice, but we need to make sure appropriately that there's the support there and the opportunity there for everybody, especially those who can't afford that, who don't have the means to do so. And uh, that's certainly why I've been very proud to make sure that our approach to investment in schools uh, is one that has 
delivered on many of the core fundamentals of David Gonski's original report about delivering needs-based funding, yep. extra support to the schools who most need it. Um, just a quick one here. Um, what percentage of Commonwealth funding for schools goes to private and religious schools as opposed to public schools? Uh, well, Tony, uh, you're right. Uh, a no, large I'm just asking part... a question. No, 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 I can't, I can't recall the exact percentage offhand. Yeah. Uh, but uh, indeed, the Commonwealth historically uh, has been the dominant funder uh, of non-government schools. It's, that's, it's been plus, the, that's been plus the case 60 under, plus, isn't it? That's right. right, and that's been the case under both Liberal and Labor governments uh, for a long period of time, since the 1960s when the federal government first got involved in funding schools. It's important, though, to stress then that if you look at total taxpayer funding going to schools, so state plus federal expenditure, Overwhelmingly, there's additional support that rightly goes into government schools that, uh, from memory, I think it's around about $12,000 per student for government schools, several thousand dollars less on average for non-government school students. So the taxpayer support in net terms is discounted okay. to take effect of the fact that people are choosing to opt out of the government system and that they're making their own contribution. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm cutting off only because uh, for time reasons, but uh, Geordie. Well, I've gone to, I've been involved in public education my whole life. I haven't been to, to a private school. But what I would say is that my experience has been very similar to yours. And I think uh, that it is really unjust to, um, to pr public schools who are actually still in need of more funding to um, sort of put them on the side and still give funding to private schools. I'm not saying um, eliminate all private school funding, but I think that there does need to be some reductions. And it's wonderful to hear Simon talking now about how much money that they're putting into the schools. But I believe that there are still so many issues within the education system which are failing not only us as students, but also teachers, that, uh, that the government is avoiding and not investigating, and therefore it's leaving us with a very unjust outcome. Simon, we're going to come to some of those issues later. Lauren, what do you think? I, it's a bit unfair. You're the only uh, <laughs> private school student on this panel, but there are plenty mm. of uh, private school students in the audience mm. alongside uh, public school students. Mm. Um, I think despite the fact that you've had obviously a really good experience at your school, um, that's not the case for a lot of public schools across Australia, especially those in regional areas. My family originally comes from the country and yet I go to school in Sydney. Now, you've had a very good experience, but there are many kids in Australia right now that are missing out on a really good education and that's not fair. And they need more funding. And I look around and I see a lot of really great private schools and I start to wonder, do they really need the funding that they're getting? Of course they do to some degree because it takes a load off the government. They take uh, some, of, some of that load, they bear the brunt. But at the end of the day, we have so many regional schools, we have so many schools that have a high proportion of Indigenous students there that are underfunded, that are neglected. They are particularly in regional areas. So yes, you may have had a really good uh, experience at your school, but there are kids around Australia who haven't been given that opportunity. And it is so wrong because every single child in Australia should have the right to an equal education. It shouldn't matter who your family is. It shouldn't matter how much your parents make. It shouldn't matter what area you live in. But unfortunately, this isn't the current state of the Australian education system. And I hope as we look to the future, it gets a lot better. We're seeing with Gonski 2.0 that there are a lot of reforms taking place, that we're reforming funding models in regards to education but more needs to be done. Tanya. Well, the big difference between um, Simon's version of needs-based funding and our version of needs-based funding, Labor's version, is $17 billion over the next decade. And our funding would have gone in the fastest time to the neediest kids. Biggest increases, fastest time, neediest uh, schools and neediest kids. And we just don't think it's fair that um, if you're talking about a kid going to a private school, the Commonwealth Government pays 80% of the cost of educating that child. But if you're talking about a kid who goes to a public school, the Commonwealth Government pays 20% of the cost of educating that child. And Simon says, you know, Commonwealth's traditionally paid more for private school kids. There's nothing that says that it should be that way. We have always said that every child in every school, in every system, in every state and territory deserves the, the, to get to the same point. 
Uh, Tanya, I'm going to interrupt you because we've got a question on this subject. I'm going to go straight to it. Ben Jones. Uh, as it stands, socioeconomic background and location is the best indicator of a young person's likelihood of achieving educational success at school. So for a lot of people, including us kids from Northern Sydney, it seems really strange that a school like Wilcannia Central School will be receiving only $60,000 over the 2018-19 period from the coalition's Gonski, uh, as opposed to the real Gonski's $660,000. How can the government justify the significant cuts that affect the most vulnerable communities in Australia? Before we go to the government, we'll hear from the Education Minister. I'm sure he'll have something to say about that. Um, I want to hear from our other panellists. Arthur, what do you think about the general principle of, of Gonski yes. and private versus... Uh, public school funding, but also the, the model of socio-economic funding they're talking about? I think there's a niche that private schools can address. I think if there, are, if there is indeed a lack of quality public school alternatives, I think the government needs to step in and say, well, it's too expensive for us to set up a school there, so we're just going to fund whatever's there. However, I think met in metropolitan areas where most of Australia's population lives, there is good, high-quality public schools, okay? And th the issue then becomes the government spends $11 billion, projected to spend $11 billion this financial year on private schools and significantly less than that on public schools. This is the, the Commonwealth government. The issue then becomes the, is funding for private schools really worthy of $11 billion? If indeed that only some private schools need to be funded, i.e. the ones where the government needs to fund it because there are no other alternatives, then the, in those situations, the governments must fund it. But is, there a, is it worth $11 billion worth of school funding? Is there a, enough bad schools in Australia that is worth $11 billion of Commonwealth spending with which they are spending on private schools? I think. I mean, I understand the, the rationale behind private schools. In Indonesia, where I came from, the public school system was not as good as the one in Australia. So my parents sent me to a private school because it was the best alternative. However, in Australia, I think our public school system is so much better than many other countries. And I think we need to reconsider our levels of private school funding by the Commonwealth government because I think it is far too much, $11 billion is far too much to spend on private schools. Let's, let's hear from Nadia before I throw back to uh, the Minister. Uh, I'm a proud public school student and I have succeeded in many areas because of the school that I've gone to. It's provided me with incredible opportunities. Um, but what we know, what there's absolutely no doubt about is that a strong education system provides a productive society. Investing in education now means that we're reaping the rewards in the adults, that, in the children that we're investing in when they become adults, when they become productive members of society. Um, the economic benefits of which are endless. So I think what we need to be focusing on is, I, I, I agree that we, we don't need, uh, we shouldn't be abolishing all um, funding for private schools, but it does need to be reduced and that money does instead need to be directed towards public schools that, as Lauren was saying, um, many of which are in regional areas that have large communities of Indigenous students who are significantly disadvantaged and I think they are the kinds of schools, kind, the schools with needy kids, as Tanya was saying, that need to have serious um, funding Boost. Boosts, yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> um, and, yeah, that's, that's what we need to be kind of focusing our, our money into is not so much pu private school education, which at the end of the day, it's, it's a parent and child's decision whether they go to a private school or public school, but we need to be investing significantly more money into public schools because although I have um, reaped the rewards of going to a public school, I, I'm not blind to the faults of the public school system um, and I think they could be quite readily repaired um, should we invest the right amount of money into it. Simon, um, you can pick up on the figures about the Wilcannia School, but um, generally the point here being made by at least some of our panellists, in fact all of them really, is that more money needs to be spent on public schools to create a better system and to make more equity across the country. Um, you've tried to do that, you've gone part the way uh, from the, to the original Gonski plan. 
Well, Tony, I think what we're seeking to implement, and it's why indeed some schools, some private schools under our plan, under, unlike what Labor had proposed, will actually see funding reductions. But so a lot we've, will so see we've funding made, increases, so, Simon. A lot will see very, so, very big increases. So, so Tanya, we've, we've made some difficult decisions. Um, your government's policy was Not no really. school will lose a dollar and everybody got guaranteed certain rates of increase. So the we've King's said, School goes up in Sydney, Geelong Grammar goes up. So Churchy in we, Brisbane we goes have said, up. Tanya, that Our we millions. should we have said that we should stick to the formula that the Gonski panel recommended that actually is based on a needs-based calculation of indigenous student numbers, How does the King's low School social need more educational money? advantage. I haven't <laughs> I, 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 I haven't I haven't Tanya, if you're going to have yeah, if you're going to have a Gonski needs based formula, this you isn't apply it. Based. Uh, so that'll be the fourth time you've interrupted me, and <laughs> I'm sure that I've interrupted you at all. You can't just make it. Don't you worry, Jordy. I think it's a good idea I'm to really... let Simon finish his point if we can. Well, I've heard it all before. He makes stuff. Yeah, up. but you're not the you're not the <laughs> only person in the audience. There are people who Jordy's got a point to make, and I'm happy to. Sorry, Simon. I I just want to interrupt very respect respectfully. Um, <laughs> what, no, not that you didn't interrupt respectfully, but I think I just want to put this in perspective for you because um, I don't know, I'm from a rural and remote area. I go to a school which has to put really strict um, conditions on each faculty based on how much paper that they can print out of a printer because we don't have enough funding mm. to print resources on paper. And it's not acceptable, for, from my point of view, it's not acceptable for you to sit there and to say something like, well, if Labor were in government, we'd be in this situation. Because at the end of the day, the Australian public elected you as the government and you are in a, responsibil in a responsible position now um, to fix these problems. But instead, all you're doing is saying, well, if we had Labor in, this would be the, the case. And you weren't elected Good. to play the well, blame no, game. No, no, Geordie, I was... I was, I, was asked a, uh, I was asked a question juxtaposing what we'd done versus what a previous policy was. And the previous policy guaranteed rates of increases for all schools. We've said that some, some non-government schools will go backwards. Of the $23 billion extra we committed this year to school funding, the fastest rates of growth go into the government school systems. So that's ensuring that we actually are delivering according to need. Now, in terms of should non-government schools actually receive funding at all? Well, our view is that every Australian student deserves some degree of taxpayer support for their education. Now, the level of taxpayer support, when you look at federal funding and state funding that goes into schools, is significantly greater, thousands of dollars greater per student for those in the government school system compared with those in the non-government school system, as it should be. Every family who chooses to opt out of the government school system enables governments to spend more money on a per student basis on those still in the government school system. That's a choice those families make. We're not proposing in any way that we should bring non-government school funding up to a par with what government schools receive. We want to see, and we are promising and delivering now, rates of funding growth for government schools from the federal government over the next six years that are significantly faster on average than in the non-government schools. Okay, uh, Simon, just a quick follow-up on the actual question that was asked there. It referred to a specific school, the central school at Wilcannia and uh, it suggested that um, they would get an extra $60,000 under your model 2.0, Gonski 2.0, in 2018-19. Uh, Otherwise, if the original Gonski model had been put in place, they would have got 660000 Do you agree with those figures? Um, I'm doubtful about those figures. Now, there are 9,400-odd schools around the country, and unfortunately, I'm not a walking encyclopedia for each one of them. So I can't say precisely what will Kenya will or won't get, more than happy to come back to you in terms of how that is projected to grow. What I can promise, as I said, is that on average, government school um, funding contributions grow faster than non-government schools for the conversation we've been having, uh, and that we've put this year some $23 billion extra in over the next decade, which was a difficult decision. We had a conversation before about levels of government debt, We've made tough decisions there to prioritise extra investment in our schools. T Tony, can I just say, it's $23 billion compared with what Tony Abbott would have done. 
It is a $17 billion cut compared with what Labor would have done. OK. Tanya, and you can I'm, find I'm, out I'm about Will Make Kenya. that point That's, succinctly and then we'll yeah, move on. The, it, all of this has been um, FOI'd by the New South Wales Teachers Federation. You can find out exactly the figures for Will Kenya. Simon Birmingham used to have a um, school funding calculator up on a website. When's that going back up, Simon? Pretty soon, Tanya. Yeah, really? It's yeah, been, no, it's been down weeks. for about three months All right, now. so the fact-checkers can find out about the Will Kenya school, school from that losing. website, we That's hope. Why. Tanya, we have to move on. Uh, next question's from Anna Potter. My question is directed to Simon Birmingham. I come from a South Coast electorate, Gilmore, where youth unemployment is at 25.4% the highest in New South Wales and the second highest in Australia. When one in four young people cannot find a job, are our schools, TAFE and university systems really helping our youth to get the jobs of the future? Um, I, I want to go to Simon, but I want to hear from our younger panellists first. And Geordie, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I really think that the education system we have at the moment isn't really preparing us for the future that's ahead of us. We have so many new emerging technologies which are coming our way and unfortunately we're not being compensated for that. Um, for me, uh, my idea is that at a good education system, which is not what we have in Australia, a good education system should do three things. Firstly, it should provide knowledge and understanding. And granted, that's something that our government does do quite well through the curriculum. We've got a plethora of subjects to choose from. But what we don't do well is we don't allow students to go that one step further and to allow them to become curious about what they can do with that information that they're learning at schools. And we don't allow them to become inspired about the, the future prospects of this nat nation. Um, and therefore, we are failing students. We are failing them uh, on getting a good future and it's just so unjust. Arthur, what do you think? I know you mentioned something about TAFE and to the best of my memory, I, I recall that TAFE enrolment rates have decreased in recent years and I think that can be attributed to the rise of private colleges and whatnot that the um, government has funded increasingly. And the, the problem is if you look at the list of skill shortages in Australia, all right, they're not, they're not accountants, lawyers, or things that require a university degree. They're trades workers. And I think it's important, all right? Young people who might not want to go to university, they are given an adequate opportunity to enter the trades because that's where the skill shortages are. That's where Australian, that's why Australia lacks workers in, all right? And I think it's important that we reconsider the, um, the rise of private colleges with you know, fancy names that tempt you to go there. I think we, re we need to reconsider whether they do have the best interests of the students at heart or are they there for the purposes of simply money making. And I think, I think you, can have, um, you can have money making objectives and education at the heart. That's what, we have that's what we have private schools for, but I think the primary objective of such private colleges, it can be mistaken that they are, they are just there for the money because we've seen time and time again, private colleges going bust because one, they didn't meet the required standards of teaching and two, because they were fraudulent. So I think- At least you're not like Kevin Rudd who goes, I have three points to make. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna go to Lauren, what do you think? Um, I think the problem has two prongs. Firstly, in the school system, where I think our generation is kind of in this weird in-between stage where we haven't had a massive emphasis on STEM, but this is where all the jobs are right now. But I do think that the government has realised that this is an area of growth in the future and they are uh, putting in measures to increase young people's participation in STEM subjects because we realise that this is an area of growth. It's where jobs are in the future, high paying ones, and so we want to kind of nudge kids in that direction. That is the first prong. Now, moving on to the second one, the other problem is universities. They are churning out kids in degrees that we already have an oversupply of. That is that we already have an oversupply of lawyers and, and an oversupply of teachers. Yet, these are some of the degrees, education and law, that are the most popular at universities and continue to be. And I think that yes, the resolution lies with going back to schools, nudging kids in the interest of STEM, but also universities need to sit down with students and talk to them realistically about the fact that there is an oversupply in these occupations and say, 
you can do this, but be aware of the fact that there is an oversupply. Another issue with unis, um, which I think the government has actually put forward a really good initiative lately, um, or they're proposing, is that in, I think, 2019, uh, performance contingent funding for universities. I think that is a really great measure that's being put forward. It's making unis think about the way that they teach um, so that they can have better students come out of those universities who are more employable. So that's also something that I think is really good that's being targeted at youth unemployment. Nadia. Before I go to the Minister. Um, as Lauren said, we have an oversupply of lawyers and teachers and, and also, as she said, that is something that is one of the most... Th both of those degrees are two of the most sought-after degrees in university. But as Arthur said, we need to be nudging kids in the direction of trade because at the moment that is where the jobs are and at the moment that is a lucrative industry. So in order to combat youth unemployment, which is preventing majorly kids and, and young people getting into the housing market, we need to be ensuring that we're preparing them adequately in the education system, which, as Geordie pointed out, has significant flaws. We need to be ensuring that we're preparing them for real life, for their real jobs, and that is being realistic about employment prospects and make sure that they're educated and aware of the fact that there is an oversupply of lawyers, there are, there is an oversupply supply of teachers, and maybe we need to be focusing more on trade, but that is maybe not so much putting an increased focus on glamorising universities and, and I think it, there's this perception, particularly within my generation, in the group of people that, that I know, that TAFE is kind of something that you fall back on if, if uni isn't an option. And I think that is, that's an attitude that we okay. need to be moving away that takes from. Us, that, you've just taken us straight to a question that I'm going to go to before I bring the Minister and Tanya Plibersek in. It's from Harry Hanley. Vocational education and training is often regarded as a lower class of education, yet it is most likely vet-trained workers that built this ABC studio set up your mics and are operating these cameras. What is the government going to do to give VET the respect it deserves? Simon Birmingham. Oh, well, thanks, um, thanks, Harry and, uh, and Anna, before that, in terms of your questions. Yeah. If you go and pursue a vocational education pathway, particularly a traditional trades-based apprenticeship, your employment likelihood, if you complete that apprenticeship, is better than if you've gone to university. Your income, is usually better at that stage than a starting graduate. Certainly, for many professions or disciplines, an apprentice will go on to have better incomes than some university graduates. The likelihood of you being self-employed, owning your own business, all of those sorts of things are also greater. So there's really a challenge there for us to make sure that people truly understand the benefits of thinking about vocational pathways. Now, this year we made some big changes to the way we support vocational education. We said we're going to create a new fund, a Skilling Australians Fund. It's got $1.5 billion attached to it. Uh, and what we're going to do is really focus that in around apprenticeships, traineeships, the types of pathways that have strong links to employers and therefore to really good employment outcomes, which we think are critical. I do want to just say more generally, I think we have a good education system, a really good education system. Great schools, as you've heard from many of the students here tonight. We shouldn't talk our education system, our schools down at all. But it is undergoing a state of transition. The economy has got massive changes and we have to make sure those changes are reflected in the way we teach, what we teach. I think Lauren picked up on a very good okay. point about some of the changes there. When I go and visit schools, particularly primary, middle school years, the engagement in STEM that is happening now is fantastic, but yes, it's Simon, probably we've got only quite a lot of questions to get through. So I'll just ask our um, told politicians in particular, just to keep it a bit shorter. Uh, Tanya Plibersek. Look, I agree with Simon. I, I think we've got a good education system, but we really want a great education system. And <clears throat> what we know is more and more people will need some post-secondary school education, whether it's university or whether it's a TAFE. And for most people, it won't be one course they do after school. It'll be a lifetime of learning, picking up additional skills. Absolutely, vocational education is a really important part of that. And, um, you know, that's why it is so disappointing that this government has cut almost $3 billion from TAFE and vocational education. There's 138 thousand fewer apprentices and trainees today than when Labor left office. That is a serious problem. Um, can't cut schools, cut TAFE and cut universities and have an excellent education system. Quite a lot of questions to get through. Um, the next one's from Cole Johnson. Totally different subject. Um, over the course of the marriage uh, equality debate, 
the validity of many young Australians' sexuality and gender identities has been seemingly under attack, the country becoming a more dangerous and a, a more confusing place for those who are coming to terms with who they are. Don't young LGBTI plus Australians have a right to identity and sexual health education on par with their heterosexual counterparts? Arthur, start with you. Um, what do you mean by a right to...? So shouldn't uh, LGBT uh, plus young people receive the same amount of um, education, sexual health education, specifically in relation to their identity um, as heterosexual people in high school? I think the, the issue with sex education in general is that I think Australia's system is good. I think it advocates for responsible responsible sexual conduct. I think it's, it's much better than other countries that insist on abstinence and things like that. So back to your question, I, I do think that hypothetically, the governments must fund those same programs as they do with the heterosexual people. But personally, I, I, I don't have any, I haven't had any experiences personally where I can say I've met someone from that community saying to me, this is not enough. So I'm afraid that because I don't have enough personal experience, I'm not gonna insult your knowledge there, insult your superior understanding of this topic and suggest something that I have absolutely no position on. Uh, let's hear from the other panellists, Nadia. Yes. They absolutely should. And that $122 million that went into that postal vote that nobody even wanted in the first place, that should have gone to at least funding mental health programs for the LGBT youth or into same-sex education for LGBT youth. It is absolute... I, it just astounds me that $122 million went into this divisive and intolerant pl plebiscite and, um, and there are same, the same sector education is being denied to LGBT youth. There, there have been articles released in the past few weeks that have stated that the mental health of LGBT youth has gone down drastically since this plebiscite came out. And if, I mean, I could talk about this plebiscite and the ramifications on society for days, but I won't. Good. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but Do you yes. want to hear from the other panellists? Yeah. Lauren. Um, just in regards to what you're saying, I think the postal survey probably has been the most realistic way to actually see some really great change in regards to LGBT youth and how they are perceived in society. Because realistically, this is the first step towards a brighter and better Australia to LGBT people. It's the first time we are seeing some government action on this, and I think that's really great. And despite the fact that there have been problems, there have been challenges along the way, it does represent something really great, and that is that there is really positive change. Um, so you're positive about the Safe Schools program, for example, which has been so controversial in some mm. states? I do think that there have been some legitimate concerns for religious schools in regards to the Safe Schools program. However, I think what it stands for is something really great, and that is... Um, you know, stopping the discrimination against LGBT youth at school. Uh, in no way should your sexuality impact how much abuse or hate you sign up for at school. That is absolutely disgusting. So what I think in regards to safe schools is that perhaps a better way that it could be integrated into the curriculum could be through the PDHP program that we have, for example, right now here in New South Wales. It is a great program that I think perhaps we could insert some parts about anti-bullying strategies for LGBT youth into that section. I think perhaps safe schools or, um, isn't the right answer, but I think some of the things it stands for need to be implemented into the PDA. Okay, let's hear program. from uh, Jordan. I think Arthur wants to come back as well. Sorry, respectfully, Lauren, I think uh, your comments about the plebiscite being a good thing is absolutely ludicrous. Yep. It, is, it is just... It is, it is so ludicrous to suggest that it's a good thing because, really, it hasn't been a respectful debate at all. And I know we've heard a lot um, in the media, and I will say that um, what we've heard in the media has been quite tame because um, certain media organisations have a responsibility to, to keep, it, keep it that way. 
But as soon as you go online and you see um, such as like the Sydney Morning Herald who might post an article about the plebiscite, if you go through those comments, there is such a, an abundance of disrespectful and hateful comments which truly are, are making the LGBTI community feel so isolated and feel, un, and feel so unrespected mm -hmm. in what should be a really progressive nation. Um, and Arthur, oh, sorry, Arthur just wanted to jump back in. So I, I acknowledge that the... Um, postal survey may have had negative consequences, but my personal opinion that it is, is that the postal survey was necessary to ascertain public support for same-sex marriage because same-sex marriage is a question of values. But it's a question is, of this values. Is, this is a majority voting on an issue that affects a minority. This, is, this doesn't concern over 80% of the population. This is... <laughs> The LGBTQ community should have their relationship and their love recognised by the state in the same way that heterosexual couples are. That is an absolute... So, very briefly, to pick up Arthur's point, if the way through the impasse is for this vote to have an overwhelming yes vote and for the government to get, then get on board, would you be happy with that result? I would, but I, think, I don't think the government should have spent $122 million in the first place <laughs> okay. to Perhaps. fund this postal vote right. that gave them a scapegoat to do their jobs. Their job was to vote and to represent the interests of the public, which was overwhelmingly, see, yes, we want this. And now we have this postal vote that has created a national platform to debate and pull apart and dissect the relationships of same-sex couples as, as though they're not human. Like, that's, de that's right. demoralising. OK, Geordie, quickly. I was just, just going to say, I was really just going to say perhaps that the government could have just taken one step and done their job, like you said, because at the end of the day, it is their job, whether it be about values or whether it be about just normal legislation, at the end of the day, we, the Australian people, elected them to represent our views. OK. Uh, Simon Birmingham, now, the question was slightly different to the discussion that went on around it, but the question was about uh, really safe schools type programs and whether the LGBTQ plus community um, should actually have the opportunity for equal um, sex education. That was the mm. question. And I think, Cole, that young people, uh, young students uh, at schools uh, who uh, may have questions over their sexuality, uh, may need assistance, ought to be able to access the same type of assistance, the same type of support as any other student in terms of questions about sexual health or any of those other factors that rightly should be taught. Now, I think what we've seen is a number of states uh, following the Safe Schools program have rightly said we're going to pick up all of the best pieces of that, make sure that it is then part of the consistent curriculum that is delivered in terms of, uh, in terms of personal health, sexual health, respect across the school community, uh, so that regardless of what the issues that might create divisiveness in a school community, they are all addressed in an inclusive manner right across the board. So I think on that front, uh, it is right that we see state governments like here in New South Wales say they're going to implement a program that is comprehensive in terms of its inclusivity in schools. I just also want to say in terms of the postal survey very quickly, we know in a little over a week what the result is. I hope that it's a very strong yes vote. And if it is a very strong yes vote, then I think we will have seen a very strong public affirmation of support for Australians in the lesbian and gay and transgender communities, and that that will actually then be a very positive thing. I appreciate many people don't like the process that may have come to this, but if it is a strong yes vote, then that type of positive affirmation is something that I hope people will find very affirming as they, uh, as they look to the future, and indeed it will be, of course, a positive endorsement of the change that will then ensue in relation to our marriage laws. But briefly, Tanya Plibersek, um, do you accept that the result might end up being what well, you wanted all along? I, I, I very much hope that there's a yes vote, but the problem is the same people who brought the postal vote on as a way of delaying or preventing marriage equality now want to fiddle with the legislation that's before the parliament. So instead of having this done by Christmas, it'll drag on again. So 
I'm not as optimistic as Simon about how this will turn into a positive experience. We know that calls to support services have increased very dramatically, that a lot of people are reporting psychological distress. And one of the reasons is even people who've been out for years who are very comfortable with their own sexuality are saying, my, my mum's voted against me or my best friend or my sister's voted against me or my family have surprised me by not supporting my human rights. And, th and pushing that conflict into families, it never needed to happen. But okay. I did actually want to address the question as well, you, you if can, it's possible, very, very quickly. Very brief, sorry about that. Um, absolutely. We, we have to have um, much more uh, open and frank discussions about sexuality uh, uh, than we do. And we've seen just today reports coming out about STDs rising, like gonorrhea has increased very dramatically in recent years, just as an example. But, rela but relationships aren't just biology either. And I think when we're talking about um, sex education, uh, we need to be talking about um, relationships, consent, how, how to give it, how to express it, how to ask for it, how to be sure you've got it, um, respectful relationships. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried about, you know, um, the... Uh, um, um, sharing of images without permission, the, the sort of humiliation that goes on um, online, um, unwelcome sexting. We have to be talking about all of those issues as well as just the biological act. OK, you're watching the Q&A High School special. If you've got something to say, join the discussion on Twitter and on Q&A Extra on Facebook Live and ABC News Radio straight after this program. Our next question comes from Adam Spackman. Um, as a Rajri man, I would like to know, um, can we... Sorry. How, um, how can we ever achieve uh, reconciliation when we don't even recognise Aboriginal people in the Constitution of Australia? Geordie, I'll start with you. Yeah, that's such a great question because it highlights such an important issue at the moment. And what you're saying is absolutely right. It is about time that the government um, take the step to hold a referendum to finally um, make this recognition. Uh, We've seen, we've seen just over the past few days um, the Indigenous community come forward to say we would like to have a body who could at least just consult with the politicians about um, policy and, and Indigenous affairs that are going on in the parliament. And once again, that was knocked back by this government. And it's really unacceptable that we've got a government who aren't um, willing to take the steps to actually uh, recognise the indigenous and um, traditional owners of this land. Yeah, Simon Birmingham, uh, that happened um, in a very strange time when the government had all sorts of other things on its plate and uh, some people said it was like we were throwing out the trash, getting rid of a bit of bad news by saying we're not going to go along with this idea uh, put forward in the Uluru Statement. Um, how do you justify not having a, a really serious sit-down discussion with the Aboriginal community before making that decision not to go with the Indigenous voice? Well, Tony, I think we saw a very significant change in this discussion that for years, years, governments and the parliament had been discussing how we might achieve Indigenous recognition. And that there was very strong bipartisan support for ensuring Indigenous recognition in the constitution. It came somewhat out of left field, the statement from Uluru that recommended instead of the types of changes that had been advocated to date of recognition within the constitution, that instead the Constitution should enshrine a voice, uh, a voice that wasn't clearly defined in terms of. But Noel Pearson's what it would been talking about this be. for years. Well, Noel may have been talking about it for years, but all of the discussion that had ensued really around recognition had focused indeed on that recognition, not necessarily how we might create some alternate body enshrined in the Constitution that would provide a separate voice from the nation's parliament, a separate voice from whatever other institutions are established and advisory bodies and so forth. Tanya and I have had the distinct honour, I think, of serving in the parliament during a period of years where the number of Indigenous representatives elected has grown dramatically. When we were both first elected, there was Neville Bonner sitting in the Liberal Party's history, there was Aidan Ridgway uh, and very few other notable Indigenous Australians who had served openly as Indigenous Australians. We, of course, have now seen a number from both sides of politics, and that's something we're very proud of. And that but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ask you, because we're of. running out of time, um, just to stick to the point here, um, why ditch this idea without having a proper discussion with the people that propose it, that is, the Aboriginal community? Well, Tony, we think that it is 
the wrong proposal and that it is a potentially, if you look at and think about it going through to a referendum, a potentially divisive proposal. We want to, and we stand by Indigenous recognition, but we want to make sure that if an Indigenous recognition proposal is taken to a referendum, it is a unifying proposal. It is one that achieves the support you, of the vast you, have majority you, have, can, of Just the idea of unity when you've rejected the position coming from the Aboriginal community, is that really possible? Have you not just killed off the idea of any referendum on this? I hope not, I hope not Tony, because I hope we can come back to the core point around recognition. Recognition in the constitution of the first Australian. Okay, all right. I want to hear from the student panellists. Nadia. Um, I think by not recognising Indigenous Australians in the Constitution, we're actively participating in the isolation of such a fundamental part of our community. And I think that that's really, really, really worrying and dangerous. Um, there are a number of issues within the Aboriginal community um, that we see in regional areas as a result of, for example, a lack of funding um, in, in regional schools, as, as we mentioned earlier. But I think it just... It astounds me that we, without consulting the Aboriginal community, we rejected the ability for them to have a council of people that would advise and work together with the government on issues that concerned Aboriginal people. I mean, who better to represent the community than their community leaders? And we've, we've not allowed this to go through. It's just, yeah, I, th I think it's, yeah, very disappointing. Arthur. I think, Adam, the greater injustice is the fact that there is a massive social and economic gap between Indigenous Australians and non-Indigenous Australians. So I think, I think, personally, it's more important that we address the future prospects of Indigenous Australians because the unemployment rate for Indigenous Australians is about 20%. That's about four times as high than the national average of 5.5%. I think that is the greater injustice, even bigger than... Um, the lack of recognition. I think the lack of recognition itself is an injustice, but I think it's important that we move forward to the future and ensure that we are able to close the gap between... Right. Sorry, Arthur. Um, Laura. I definitely agree with you, Arthur. I mean, recognition for Indigenous people in the Constitution is something that we seriously need to head towards. It's something that we need to do. It's 100% right. But when I have a look at the state of Australia and the fact that Indigenous kids are 26 times more likely to be locked up than non-Indigenous kids, I see a major issue. And when I look at the Uluru Summit, I see some of those things that were mentioned are great and we should head towards a better and brighter Australia in regards to Indigenous recognition in the future. But I think we already have so many conciliatory bodies, so many committees that I worry that this body would become tokenistic and that it would perhaps be used by governments as, oh, look, they've already got this body. Why do we have to put funding into this? I think first and foremost, we need to get so many of the social and economic problems, as Arthur mentioned, um, fixed because the state of Indigenous people in jail disgusts me and it disgusts the entirety of Australia. The fact that we have kids, uh, Indigenous kids in rural areas who are teenagers and can't read and write is absolutely terrible and it is Australia's shame. And I think first and foremost, we need to fix that before we start having conversations about conciliatory bodies. All right, we're going to go back to our questioner, Adam. How, how did you feel as a Wiradjuri man, as you say, uh, when the government rejected the idea of the Indigenous voice? Um, I, in my opinion, I just, I think we should just recognise the Aboriginal, because they were the first Australian, like they were here for 70,000 odd years. And just the fact that we don't recognise them as like sort of in the like Australian thing, it's just, it's not right in my opinion. I've got, uh, Tanya, you mentioned this earlier on. I'll give, I'll give you 30 seconds on it because we're... Written, Look, we're I, out of time. I think it's really important to listen to First Nations people about what they want. And with the Uluru Declaration, people had an opportunity. There was a lot of meetings in the lead up to it. A lot of thought went into it. Um, we have to consider that um, uh, the statement that calls for, uh, um, yes, the sort of practical things that the other um, panellists have talked about, closing the gap in health, education, employment, life expectancy, child mortality and so on, but also the important symbolise, uh, uh, symbolism of saying um, in our in our 
most fundamental document, the Australian Constitution, First Nations people have a most important place in Australia. Uh, and then talking about the other, the other practical suggestions from the, um, from the uh, Uluru Declaration that talk about the treaties, Makarata, um, making amends. I, we've, got to, we've got to look at it all. We've got to be open to it all. So you've turned that into policy, the Labor Party, I mean. Uh, is, is that... Well, we've, it, we've will there be such a... Will there be such a referendum on precisely having Indigenous voice if Labor were to win? Well, we, we, we've said we're open to these discussions, absolutely, and we are disappointed that the referendum's been put on the back burner at the moment. Um, Simon, do you want to have one quick last word on that? Um, is there something you're comfortable with, this, the way this has been sort of thrown out? Well, Tony, as I said, I, I hope it hasn't been thrown out. And I think you went back to Adam before and uh, he rightly said he'd like to see recognition. We'd like to see recognition as well. Uh, and years were spent talking about the nature recognition could take. It was very much a last minute, left field uh, take that brought about the notion of the voice as something quite different from the type of recognition that had been discussed beforehand. I'd love to see us get back to those discussions, something that can be a unifying statement of recognition in our constitution, embraced by all Australians. All right, I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Lauren mcgrath Wild, Tanya Plibersek, Arthur Lim, Nadia Homem, Simon Birmingham and Geordie Brown. Thank you very much. Now, remember, you can continue the discussion on Q&A Extra with Tracy Holmes and Abdullah Sankari, a Year 10 student from Sir Joseph Banks High School. They're taking comments on ABC News Radio and Facebook Live just as soon as we finish. Next week on Q&A, particle physicist, science broadcaster and former rock star Brian Cox, the Assistant Minister for Cities and Digital Technology, Angus Taylor, the Shadow for Universities and Equality, Terry Butler, and economist Judith Sloan. Till next week, good night. Thank <laughs> you.